Okay, so today and for lesson five, we are going to be focused on being right here, right now in the moment and developing the skills that we need related to grounding ourselves in the present moment in order to um, in order in order to hone the skills related to diffusion and acceptance and um, perspective taking that we've been talking about. So the check-in activity for today, the five minute writing prompt, the prompt was, I'm a person who does not. And my response to this writing prompt really started to get me to think, get me thinking about the fact that I have throughout my life been a, been a person who does not want to fail. I have gone through many years of my life going to great lengths to be impeccably perfect and have suffered a lot of pain because of that, because either I have pushed myself to my, you know, to the breaking point of what's humanly possible, or I have given up because something seemed too insurmountable or wasn't going to be able to do something perfectly. So I stopped what I was doing and let things go because I didn't want to Put myself out there in order to be judged. As, as I was growing up, I you know, fought to prove myself, and I, but I never really felt like enough. And that came from being treated like I was not enough, being told I wasn't enough. And then eventually those words that, you know, that were surrounding me in my environment started to be things that I would say to myself that I'm not enough. And so the, you know, the words that we hear in our environment become our thoughts. And as we go through life and experience things moving forward, they become the words, they become our self-talk. And so over the years, it has been really hard for me as a person um, to fully accept who it is that I am and fully feel comfortable in my own skin. And it has taken years of years of practice and really digging deep to get down to the bottom of why I have experienced or why have why have I, I have experienced those things, how how those thoughts and recurrent the recurrent patterns of behavior have come to be in my life. And you know, finally coming to a place in my life where I have I can fully accept myself for who I am and truly believe the statement I am enough. So now I have come to be a person who, where I used to be a person who cared a lot what pe other people thought and would hold myself back and inhibit my actions in order to prevent people from judging me negatively. I mean, I'm at a point now where I don't care if somebody is judging me because that isn't, that isn't what I am worried about. That's not what I value. So people can go away and go ahead and judge away and um, and but that doesn't necessarily that doesn't control any longer the experience that I have and the effort that I'm willing to put forth in my life to share my values with others and live my life to the fullest. So as I said today we're going to be talking about honing those skills related to remaining grounded in the present moment. So much of our life we spend either worrying about the things that have happened in the past or um, thinking about what is going to happen in the future and predicting the problems that we're going to have and the challenges that we're going to have to overcome, which tend to pull us completely out of the moment and cause us to miss really important cues and clues within our environment that would help us be most successful. The, the skills that we have been talking about and working on related to, to diffusion and perspective taking and acceptance are truly enhanced when we find our ability to ground ourselves in the present moment on a regular basis. Because diffusion requires us to be in the here and now. It requires us to really listen to our inner thoughts, really feel the feelings that we are feeling in order to then um, diffuse those thought patterns and action patterns that have become so automatic 
and almost create a reflective response pattern. When we're not in the present moment, it is almost impossible to fully take the step, take the perspective of others because we're not in a place where we're fully attending to all the stimuli and all the cues in our environment. And so if we're focused on, if we're thinking about our pain and our suffering and we're worrying about what's going on, I'm not able to fully attend to the people in my environment and the things that they're saying, both verbally and non-verbally. I'm not able to fully attend to the rest of the cues in, in the environment that might be impacting their ability to be fully present in the environment as well. And so when we as individuals in our personal lives, in our family, in our community, in our work lives, if we, if we develop the skills that help us become really grounded in the present moment, we can be more attentive and attend to those stimuli in our environment which are the most critical to enhancing our, our communication and our interactions as humans. And then finally, when it comes to acceptance, if we're not in the present moment, we're not really feeling what we're feeling, there's not going to be, a, we're not going to have the ability to really learn from that pain and learn from the things that we are experiencing on a day-to-day -day basis because we're so preoccupied with what's going on, uh, what's going on in our, in our minds as opposed to just letting be what is and breathing through it and moving forward from that. When you, so when you have a full awareness of your current environment, both internal and external, you're able to think about the thoughts that you're having, feel the sensations that are, that are present, your physiological responses that are going on in your body. And in that moment, when we can, when we can hear our thoughts and we can feel the feelings and we, it, and we can um, in, interpret more accurately those things that are going on within us. And also, those are, those are things that could be clouding or uh, swaying our perception of what is going on in our external environment as well, or um, modify our responses that we have. Because if I am not really aware of the pain that I'm feeling or the thoughts that I'm thinking about, and there's something going on in my environment that would typically be a trigger for me um, having an emotional response. If I'm not in the present moment, I'm not aware of those patterns that are going on. It's more likely that I am going to respond reflexively to the external environmental cues as opposed to responding in a mindful or thoughtful. So the problems, the problems that are created when we are not in the present moment are due to being completely disconnected from the here and now. I'm disconnected from myself, disconnected from others, disconnected from my environment, and really not able to fully give in and fully live, live in the moment and take the actions necessary to make the changes in our lives which are going to continue to guide us on the path towards our valued life. So what this really requires us to do is to commit to breaking those old habits. First, we need to be aware of them and what they are and what those patterns are. And then a commitment to modifying our own behavior in the moment, which requires us to first practice the skills. Because as we know, there, over the years, we, you have developed a series of behaviors which have been trained and practiced over years and years and years. Those neurological pathways are, have become very strong and have created neural networks and, and response patterns which almost feel as though they are, you know, they're, they're almost feeling as, as if they're reflexes, not reflexes, but it's a, a, what, what I call a reflexive response. 
So there's a trigger, there's a response. The response latency between those two events is very short um, because that is a, a highly practiced response that we can that we can engage in in a somewhat mindless way without really thinking. It's very automatic. And so by learning how to come more fully into the present moment and identify the things that are going on inside and out, outside of us, take the, pers take the perspective of others and what they're going through, accept what is for what it is, we are more able and more ready to break those old habits and be more thoughtful and mindful about what we are going to do and how we're going to take action to change. So this idea of mindfulness helps us and being able to pra practicing the skills of mindfulness helps us notice in the moment those thought and action patterns that have become recurrent and habitual that need but are not leading us into a valued life. In those moments when we notice those things, we can then make a different choice about the actions or that we're going to take, the words that we're going to say, and the things that we're going to do that are going to be more adaptive, more in line with our values, um, and lead us not to just in the moment get rid of the pain or access the good stuff, but potentially, and most importantly, accept the pain for what it is as part of the process towards growth and development and living a when we live in a state of mindlessness, we tend to lose sight and lose connection of, to what really matters. And um, so when we're, and that creates this pattern of responding automatically, responding reflexively, and really thoughtlessly. And what I, the experience that I've had in my life is that this thoughtless, reflexive responding causes problems with has caused for me problems within my relationships because the people who, with whom i'm interacting or because i'm physically present in their environment expect that i'm also mentally present with them and fully connected um, have gotten to the point where they are you know thinking that i don't necessarily care about what is going on and i'm not invested in that thing really in the moment. And so this is, these are the problems that tend to happen to us as humans when we're physically present but not mentally present. It can affect our interpersonal relationships as well. I really, really think that the chessboard analogy for the idea of present moment or, and being grounded in the present moment is a very powerful one. Um, because, number one, most people in this world have had, or in this, um, I am aware of, have had some exposure to the game of chess, and so it's something that people can connect to pretty easily. And it's a, um, and it's a really kind of concise way to put all of this together. So the chessboard analogy first gets us to think about when we identify as the pieces of the board. So when you have, you know, you have the um, black pieces and the white pieces and the goal is to um, you know, take over and defeat the other side. And so, you know, the game of chess is a battle. And so it's you know, one, one person makes one move, then there's a, a, def you know, there's a defensive move or an offensive move in the, um, in the, effort to you know, take over the queen and, um, and win the game. But when you are focused on that level of being, you know, being one of the chess pieces or, being, or playing on a side, you are stuck in the middle of that part. And so at that point, at that level, you're unable to see the forest for the trees as it, as it is. So you are constantly fighting, you're, act, you're acting and reacting reflexively and, and only to the things that are going on in your immediate environment without a under, an understanding of the bigger picture, what is going on on other, on other places of the world. 
And so that, at that point, that is analogous to being fused with your thoughts, fused with that battle. You're in the battle, you're, you, your hands are on the rope, and you're tugging away and, and fighting the fight. When we learn to defuse and let go of the battle, we, be, we come to a place of acceptance where we can, we can identify more with being the board. The, board, the chess board itself holds the chess pieces and contains the, contains the fight, but isn't a part of it. And so when you are able to diffuse from being one of the pieces and simply be the board, at that moment in time, you have diffused and are accepting the, accepting the feelings for what they are. It's just observing the feelings and observing the thoughts without buying into them, just being, being part of being the board and holding those things and allowing them to be what they are. And then finally, this idea of perspective taking or becoming the observing self is when you can, you're no longer identifying with the pieces, you're no longer in the trenches of the battle, you're no longer feeling or necessarily holding the pieces, but you can take a few giant steps back and really see the bigger picture and not be emotionally invested in the outcome, but just observing what is. You can, you can more mindfully um, make choices based on what you see and how, how things really look and what they really are, as opposed to what you feel they are when you're in a more fused or less accepting state. So it's important to it's important to be able to talk about and describe the patterns of behavior that we have and have experienced over time in in relation to present moment issues. Because by describing things that we have observed in our past, it can help us understand and see the patterns that have happened over time of antecedent behavior consequence patterns, environmental cues, which increase the likelihood or decrease the likelihood of responding in a certain way. Um, observing patterns and thinking about the actions of others and, and the words and the words we've heard and the things that we've seen that have impacted us and left a, left a mark um, necessarily because that's the way that our brains work. We can't forget something. We can't just take away memories. And once we've perceived it, it ha that information has gone into our brain. It's been stored somewhere um, and impacts the way that we perceive and interact with the world. So for me, in regard to my present moment issues, I was reflecting back on different stages and different periods of my life in order to illustrate to you how I would put into words what my observations were, are regarding my patterns of present moment issues and how they have impacted me throughout my life and the, and the interpersonal relationships that I have. So in my early childhood, I would say before eight years old, I really, I, I had an older brother who was about four years older than me, and I was, it was just the two of us, and I was the, I was the youngest, and um, he was somebody that I really looked up to, and I really wanted to be a part of his life, I wanted to be accepted by him, and so I fought really hard to be you know, to be the cool little sister. And I wanted to be invited to go places with him. Um, but he never, he never really accepted. Me. He would actively, he would actively uh, push me away and not want me to be a part of his life and his friends' life because, you know, I was four years younger than him. So I wasn't, I wasn't cool like him. And, um, and so that was really hard for me because I, you know, I fought so hard to get to the point of being accepted and being loved and being invited, but truly felt no love from him for those first eight years of my life. Later on in my childhood, 
Um, that was the point in my life where my mom actually had a mental breakdown and had to be hospitalized in a psychiatric institute for about two months. And at that point in time was diagnosed with bipolar disorder and was um, put on a, what I, what I consider a zombifying cocktail of medication. So this was back in the eighties um, when you know, their really heavy push for pharmaceuticals and she was on you know, five different things. And so at that point in my life, you know, I'd gone from, you know, just struggling to be a kid and be accepted and be loved and, and be, um, you know, to belong in my, you know, family unit to experiencing then a time in my family's life where my needs were no longer important. And so I, you know, I put my, put aside myself, put aside my needs, stuff down my pain, because my mom was the one who was going through the suffering and she was the one who needed the support and the attention and the, and the love. And so, you know, from the time I was about eight or nine until my teenage years, I constantly tried everything I could to step down the pain and put my needs aside in the, in the service of ensuring that her needs were met and she was taken care of. As I entered into adolescence, I began to really fight for this conceptualized sense of myself. I was, you know, I was the smart kid. I got good grades and I worked hard. I was a teacher's, you know, I was a teacher's pet. Um, and all the, all the stuff that was going on at home, all the problems that I was having were still happening, but school was a place, a place where I could thrive um, and really put forth all of my effort and put forth all of this um, intense work into being who I thought I was supposed to be or being who I thought I needed to be to fight my way out of the um, traumatic situation in which I was living. So in the school environment, I was, you know, I was pushing and I was striving to be this conceptualized sense of myself. And then in the after school hours, and weekends, it, that time was spent um, because of my home life was so was so tumultuous. Um, I spent a lot of time hiding and avoiding situations and really working to numb the pain. As I moved out of teenagehood and out of adolescence into my college years, that period of my life was really focused on drowning myself in work. So working on my university courses. And if I wasn't working on university courses, I was working a, um, a work study job. And, you know, I pushed and pushed and pushed and pushed to fill my time with work and, but, but didn't allow myself much time for anything that was of joy. And so even in my, you know, my relationships, my friendships, and my intimate partner relationships, um, I didn't, I wasn't present in those, in those times. I didn't go and do things that were really considered fun. I worked really hard and pushed myself to my breaking point many, many times. And all of the pain, all of that suffering that I had stuffed down and hid and ignored and tried to pretend wasn't there would frequently bubble up as, as angry outbursts. And so I have this one very prominent memory in my mind. As in my undergrad, I went in thinking, you know, with the plan of go on, that I was on the pre-med track and I wanted to be a pediatric ophthalmologist because there's something about the eyes and the brain and helping kids that, I, that really connected with me. And I remember this moment being, I was uh, working at a pediatric ophthalmologist office and I was so consumed with all of the stuff that I had going outside of work and um, all the stuff that I was worried about with school. And then in the back of my mind, all the stuff that was still going on with my family that in the middle of an office, a professional setting, my, you know, um, I was just a, you know, an office assistant at that point in time. I have this distinct memory of trying to 
change out the toner on a fax machine, which if I was grounded in the present moment and attending to what was going on would have been a very, very simple task. But because I was so preoccupied with everything else that was going on in my life and not really focused on this very you know, simple thing that I was asked to do, I wasn't able to get the cartridge into the machine um, easily and perfectly and right away. And that triggered a, an angry outburst response where I began crying and I took the cartridge and I threw it on the ground and made a, you know, made a huge scene that after the fact was, you know, I had so much shame over that reaction because it was so outside of who I, you know, who I wanted to be seen as and who I saw myself as in that professional environment. And it was really, you know, that, that to me was just this, uh, perfect illustration of the of what I was going through at that point in time and how my you know how all the pain and all the things that I had stuffed down for so long would just come out in these very you know almost like five-year-old tantrum type of behavioral episodes. It was after after I graduated and in my what I would consider kind of an early adulthood, that I really started to begin to shift my um, I started to shift my actions and think about what it was that I really wanted to do, who it was that I really wanted, who, I, who it was that I really wanted to be, and at that point in time in my early twenties, I began to reestablish a relationship with my mom. She you know, she was much more stable and was on a, on a very healthy path um, in her, her own treatment. And we were, you know, we had over years had been, you know, had a very tumultuous relationship, always fighting and arguing. Um, but at that point, we really began to rebuild our relationship. And I started to make this shift in my thoughts, words, and actions, which was, sadly interrupted by her death. And so at this, you know, I had this very brief window of clarity when, where I was you know, really starting to come into contact with who I was and what I wanted and what I was all about. And then suddenly my mom passed away um, from a brain aneurysm. And that re, you know, re-triggered that those patterns of behavior related to become being laser focused on work and then uh, numbing the pain in the after hours. So after after that point in time was right right at that point when I was beginning to um, shift myself into my career and beginning to, beginning to build what would eventually become my career. And so a month after my mom passed away, I got my first job as a paraeducator and began working with individuals with autism in the school environment and in the home environment as well. And at that point, I was laser focused on my career. I was, you know, I was working working during the day as a paraeducator. I was work I was working at night as a cocktail waitress to make extra money and um, save to pay for the things that that I wanted in my life and then I needed. And then outside of work um, was, you know, attempts to connect and att attempts to have fun times, but always you know, found myself in, a, in situations where it was, you know, fun gone wrong. So it was kind of go out or do things that were supposed to be fun, that were supposed to be fulfilling, we're supposed to be connecting with, with socially with people, and but would end, commonly end with you know bad things happening, crying, fighting, arguing, and waking up the next morning feeling worse than I did the day before. And so I really consider those first 35 years of my life to be a, a rather mindless existence. So there were there were pockets of greatness. But the majority of the time really felt as though it was nothingness. I let, you know, I worked really hard and I struggled and I fought and, you know, tooth and nail. But what I, 
looking back on those years of all of that struggle and strife really felt as though it was a trail of nothingness. And when I looked ahead, what I, what all that I saw was a bank of fog. I didn't, you know, I couldn't see what was ahead of me. I didn't know what my path was. I didn't know who I was anymore because I had focused so much of my time and so much of my energy on just, you know, trying to be perfect. And then in those moments when I, there was nothing for nothing that I could do to be perfect, um, those were the times when the, the pain would start to bubble up and then I would numb those and, and push those feelings down. So the objectives and the activities that we're going to be doing today are going to are all related to present moment and and um, being able to observe what's going on and be in the moment and respond in a mindful way. The first objective is to is to be able to objectively describe your patterns of behavior related to your attention to the present moment. Um, the second objective is to describe those present moment activities or exercises that are useful or helpful for you in, re in remaining in the present moment and, and attending to, to those important things. Um, and then finally, um, similarly to what we did with diffusion exercises, actually starting to create a plan or think about the, mo the times in your life or times in your life that you can actually predict when things are things like that are going to happen you might have issues with that and plan for what changes you are going to make the active changes that you are going to make to um, overcome or try or practice and develop new sets of skills um, that you can then begin to use more fluently in your day-to-day -day life. 